who's the trucks from Cuba Township that have high tech computer controls to regulate the salt distribution. And it's interestingly enough done by the consideration of the outside air and road temperature. And the trucks are checked and calibrated yearly. Our road resurfacing program has used warm mix asphalt for the last several years, as opposed to the hot mix asphalt. And how does this help? Well, less energy is needed to mix the, to heat the warm mix asphalt. So it uses less fuel and decreases the plant's carbon footprint. It's estimated it reduces the volatile co organic compound emissions in the stack at the plant by 50 to 90%, as well as having a positive impact on the workers who deal with the smoke and fumes both at the plant and at the street. The warm asphalt mix is expected to have an increased lifespan, so the additional cost to use this is not prohibitive when this is factored into the cost formula. Um, we're concerned about the health as well of our shallow aquifers, which produce most of the water our town relies on. We have um, two deep wells, which uh, supply the water for um, a section of our town, but most of our homes are on the shallow aquifer. Uh, several years ago, we installed a passive monitoring well at our village conservancy. And this well is part of a program through the Barrington Area Council of Government, which we're a member of, and the United States Geological Survey. This well monitors the level of our shallow aquifer, and it's done with computerized equipment that sends electronic data on a continuing basis directly to the USGS. We pay a yearly fee through BACOG for this equipment, but the information is also available to the Illinois State Water Survey to look at. BACOG now has started a new study on water quality, and we're participating with six other wells in our town, which are monitored with a collection of water samples to test and determine a baseline for water quality. Natalie Carney, our village engineer, collects these samples on a regular basis. Last year, we became a tree city. We've been spending significant money um, caring about our trees for years, but we failed until recently to put together an official tree committee so that we could become a member of this organization. At the same time as this, we've been working to remove the invasive species along our roadside, such as buckthorn, teasel, et cetera, and have eliminated a significant quantity of both of those and several others. The next subject I'd like to talk about is recycling. Not only do we have the standard recycling that most towns and town, most other towns have um, that pick up from waste haulers, we've added free curbside electronic recycling, the red bag curbside recycling program for small items and textile recycling. And further at the village hall, we recycle cork, fluorescent light bulbs, rechargeable batteries, mercury fixtures, and styrofoam. The styrofoam has become so popular, and we just started that this past year, that we're trying to figure out how to better manage it with a larger dumpster right now. Um, we advertise, um, and the recycling is pretty interesting because what happens is we have somebody pick it up and they compress it, and then they give it to DART, which is in Aurora, that goes to Indianapolis, and then they make it into, um, they reuse it for styrofoam again. So um, that's really been hitting our landfills and uh, we have tons of calls on that um, to, you know, to ask more about it. I think yesterday we had like three calls on it just um, in one day and we've been doing this all year. So um, let's see, we do quite a bit of public education through my postal letter, which is three or four times a year. Um, Friday e-blasts, which we put out weekly and our webpage. And so if you go to our webpage, um, www.southbarrington.org and you scroll down on the front page, we have a large section called South Barrington Sustainability. And under that four categories, which are recycling, air quality, water management, and electric. And each one of those have different categories on ways to be green. A few last items, our engineers also put together a draft for education as Lake and Pond Handbook and Resource Guide for the 35 Homeowners Associations we have in town. Um, and there's a lot of small lakes and large pounds, uh, ponds in town that the HOAs have to take care of. Um, we're also in the process of activating a sustainability advisory committee to work along with our conservancy committee. And every year we're looking for ways to become more green. So I guess that's the end of it. Thank you, appreciate it. Thank you very much. I, I think I'm, I'm most intrigued by the image of residents bringing their styrofoam to City Hall. Yeah, and yeah. Just, wow. 
Well, we have a parking lot in the back. We have a police parking lot in our back, and then we have another parking lot beyond that. And, um, and that's where we have set up recycling bins um, and the styrofoam. And we started out with just the bins and we had to get a dumpster because we're so much it was blowing around. So now we're looking at a larger dumpster to be able to take care of it. Um, we have volunteers that come and pick it up and bring it to McHenry. And um, we, we need the person from McHenry to come and get it, get the dumpster and bring it over to his, to his building so that um, we don't have all these volunteers constantly picking up styrofoam. So. Have you thought about just bringing the styrofoam to Barrington and leaving it there? <laughs> I don't know if Barrington would be too happy about that. <laughs> and I need to ask Edith and Cheryl, um, should we have a Q&A following each presentation or do you want to just continue on? It's up to you. Uh, we do have time. Okay. Any questions or comments for the Honorable Village President, President McCombie from South Barrington? A very comprehensive presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, thank I you. I love the warm mix asphalt reference. Well done. Yeah, thank you. Anyone at all? I, I have a question, Mayor. It's Mayor Oliver from Hazel Press. Yes, sir. I, I came in a little late because I was on one meeting and I got to jump off and jump to another meeting. I think some of the people online have to jump to the meeting I'm going to in a few minutes. But I, I came in late when we were talking about uh, individuals coming in like on the weekends and paving driveways. Right. Uh, how do you, uh, can you say again, how do you handle actually addressing that because a lot of times they come they come in on the weekends or Sundays where you're not you don't have you don't have the special services out how, how do you guys uh, police that or monitor that well our building inspector doesn't work on the weekends so but we do have our police force actually enforcing it and they have a list of all the contractors who have business licenses so they'll stop a truck and they'll ask them for their license and most of the people that don't have any identification on their trucks have no license as well in fact i don't think there's been one of them that has had a license and then they're told to leave town and if they're not they're ticketed and there's very stiff fines if they um, are trying to apply uh, something with a high pah in town all right thank you yeah, thank you and Mayor McCombie, we have a question in the chat. This is from the Go Green group, um, uh, Go Green Illinois. Is there a citizens environmental group or commission? Um, we have actually a sustainability um, by ordinance, but our, our group hasn't gotten together um, right after we formed it last year, then um, COVID hit. So uh, we were in the process, we had a couple of meetings and then it just kind of stopped because of the, and we do have a conservancy committee that does some work as well as internally, we do a lot of the work so on the green, but yes, we're gonna put that back together again now that we've kind of gotten used to the situation with COVID. Um, hi, um, my name is Alito uh, from Deering um, Environmental. Uh, you mentioned um, pavement ceilings and I'm not familiar as to how that works. Could, could you explain that? And then one further thing, when, when the ladies speak, they are very clear, but when Kevin comes on, it's very muffled if he could do something with maybe his his audio <laughs> i'm sorry no that's quite a, it's probably the bloody mary but thank you <laughs> <laughs> yeah i can hardly hear you kevin so okay, i will i will and the ladies are very clear thank you so in regards to the pavement ceiling you know people seal coat their driveways um we have a shopping center they seal coat their um parking area and um, throughway, and we have Willow, Church, Willow Creek Church, which is one of the largest in the United States, which has an immense amount of parking area. And so none of those are able to use any type of a sealant that is, um, has uh, high PAHs. And, and so what we've done though, is we've kept uh, the individuals, if you wanna seal your own driveway, which is very unique, and there's are few residents that do, but really not many because it's not expensive to seal your driveway. Uh, so um, for this is really for commercial applicators, which make up the majority, by far the majority, I would say 99.5 or 9% of our village um, sealants, they're the ones that are being having to have a business license. We examine the material that they're going to use. We've spot checked it in the past. Um, uh, you can tell the difference between, for instance, a coal tar sealant and an asphalt, just a regular sealant. So um, building inspector is really good at determining the difference between that. So Thank that's you. our program. You have explained it well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Did I mute, mute myself again? No, you're, you sound, Arlita, how do I sound? Better? 
uh, a little bit better, a little bit better, but still a little muffled. But that's probably the best you can do. So well, that's it's better though. That's why my, my mother said that for 55 years now. So. <laughs> You're funny. <laughs> I said, uh, President McCombe, this is uh, Dante with the Village of Hazelcrest. Uh, regarding to um, your, your requirements on the asphalt and the ceiling, is that something you guys um, uh, passed through a, a municipal ordinance? Or how are you guys, how did you guys put that into, um, uh, you know, did you have to pass that through a board action ordinance or you guys just following a, a specific set of, of codes? board action um when we did that we did that all through board action and um there were actually a couple states out east that already had passed it statewide but illinois was um not um involved in that at all so um so we our municipal ordinance but we still had many of our neighbors that are were worried they did some of their municipal parking lots etc but were um reluctant to pass that through the community and we thought no you know this is a cancer a carcinogen uh, related product and we're not in it you know your driveway sealants scuff off you carry them into your home um children's playing basketball on your driveways um goes into the streams and causes mutations in aquatic species and so we thought no this is time for us to make a move we want to protect our environment and this is one thing that we can help do that with by getting rid of them. So we basically have the ordinance. Um, sorry, but I think we need to move on. I was gonna say, that if, if there are other questions in the chat, I will uh, kindly ask our colleague Cheryl perhaps to forward those questions to the appropriate responder and that responder that can share it with you or we can share it with everyone else, so. And I will also add that we will share a resource library. Um, so if, if we can uh, get some, uh, some helpful information from all of the speakers, we'll put that together and post that on the Environment Committee page. Madam President, thank you again for your presentation. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, moving on, I have the uh, honor to introduce to all of you uh, my friend and colleague, the 40th mayor of Waukegan and the first African-American mayor, Sam Cunningham. Sam is on the board of directors and chairman of the Water Equity Commission of the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Cities Initiative. Uh, I first met Sam when we were both together at the North American Climate Summit in 2017. And he is and proudly declares himself a climate mayor. He's a good guy all around and I'm delighted to have him. Mayor Cunningham, the floor is yours, sir. clearly a soft-spoken mayor. All right, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mayor, uh, Mayor Burns. But as you mentioned earlier, our friendship has uh, started then and has gotten stronger each and every time that we meet. There's a different adventure. <laughs> uh, but welcome everybody. Uh, and thank you for uh, allowing me to speak today. Uh, we're gonna be talking, talking to you about uh, water infrastructure and equity updates. Uh, the city of Waukegan has, has been expanding our water infrastructure investments uh, and water equity initiatives to provide sustainable and clean drinking water to our residents uh, and surrounding communities who we have uh, existing contracts with. Lake Michigan is a huge asset and an incredible nature resource. Clean and affordable drinking water is, ne is necessary for the community. Uh, and we must think about the future and invest in our water plant infrastructure and policy to adequately serve our residents and the surrounding communities that we have existing contracts with. And I might add, we're looking to expand on those. Uh, one of them is our water plant infrastructure improvements. The city has been evaluating and aggressively uh, pursuing necessary infrastructure updates to the water plant over the last five years and probably 10 years prior to that, a little bit more minimal, but aggressively uh, doing that uh, for the following reasons. Uh, rehabbing our filters, uh, new uh, chemical pumps, new storage tank, and, and a high service and, and adding high service pumps to increase the efficiency and capacity uh, uh, for city of Waukegan is pumping water out of Lake Michigan we're also pursuing these updates to ensure that we can provide affordable water to our residents 
and the surrounding communities in the coming years as they may face water shortages. While Keegan's water bill is roughly around $26 a month, uh, and that is substantially low than a lot of our counterparts throughout the state of Illinois. Matter of fact, there was a Chicago Tribune article that listed Joaquin, Illinois as the third lowest water rates in the state of Illinois. Updating the infrastructure and capacity here will allow us to maintain these low rates and provide these low costs and low rates for other communities with increasing black and brown communities. Joaquin's water plant building. Assuring the, uh, the building is accessible and efficient addressing potential flooding issues posed by rising uh, lakefront levels and, store, and storm and, and inhabitants access to, uh, access to our water plant. Seeking to put solar panels on the water plant roof. As a matter of fact, we have something, I think that we just passed roughly two uh, last week of a letter of intent to have a company uh, prepare, uh, getting prepared for an RFQ to go out to have water plant, not a, a solar panel, not just on our water plant room, but any facility that we deem is necessary in, in order to, uh, up to, to, to come up to these, uh, some of our sustain, the sustainability goals. Collaborating, connecting and leading other Great Lakes communities in the effort to, uh, in the effort of water infrastructure and investment and, and equity initiatives. By chairing the binational Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Initiative Mayor's Commission on Water Equity to discuss policy solutions to issues like lead service, lead service lines, developing policy recommendation, identifying funding sources. Have, we've been very, very vocal, at least I have, about the country's need to support a stimulus water restoration bill which provide funding for infrastructure investments due to, to the efforts of climate change in COVID-19 pandemic. In conclusion, water infrastructure and equity is critical to ensure the health of residents and responsible, uh, and responsible use of natural resources. Uh, we and I am excited to continue to lead in these efforts and to invest uh, and, and to invite cities to talk to us about the efforts they are pursuing on similar initiatives. Uh, and this goes for, particularly on that northern part of the state of Illinois, uh, what the city of Waukegan, I know, I see the mayor of North Chicago, Mayor Leon Rockingham, the city of North Chicago, city of Highland Park, city of Lake Forest, and Lake Bruff. Um, and I think the only city outside of Cook County is Evanston that has water, a water plant on there. And most of our plants are, 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 are certainly are older than, than most. So investing in, in those buildings and investing in ways, not only to bring, uh, to bring more capacity and efficiency, but more importantly, keeping rates at an affordable rate for all those uh, uh, drinking water for, uh, from, from the Great Lakes, from our Great Lakes, uh, Lake Michigan. Thank you. And I'm open for any questions at this time. Thank you, Mayor Cunningham. Thank you very much. And it should be noted, ladies and gentlemen, that on the screen there we have uh, our external affairs director from Waukegan, my friend Marcus, and of course our sustainability coordinator, Maya, who are also joining us. So any and all questions for either of those three distinguished guests, the floor is open for those queries. Yeah, yes, uh, Mayor, can I um, address one question to you? Yes. Sir. Uh, looking at the uh, video, you have a very sophisticated water plant, which is wonderful. And you're able to attest and like you said, um, you, you uh, have the chemical pumps, you're checking all this out. How is it that through, how is uh, the upkeep of this wonderful plant um, uh, provided? Uh, I mean, $26 per month is wonderful and it is reasonable, um, but how do you maintain this um, without having the prices go up through the taxes of the residents? Well, one of the things we've been able to do uh, with that, ma'am, is we did a, uh, a an increase in our rates and we put it up to like 10 years. So every year it goes up. So when we bond these out, the money that we use for the increase, we pay that with the bonds. So that that really, really helps us out uh, uh, on that front of how the investment works as far as 
regular operating costs. We take a look at we take a look at that over over five year uh, over five year time, and to make sure that the rates that we are charging uh, for our, to deliver our water is uh, more than enough, not only to maintain to operate, but also to work with our our contracts of our unions. So right now we're in a very good position from what we charge versus what it costs to operate. And we take a look at that every four years. Thank you. Any other questions? Again, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mayor Burns, and I look forward where we all can get together post Zoom yes. and in person. You guys take care. Certainly all try to stay healthy, stay home when necessary, which is difficult in our positions. And God bless you all. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, to be clear, Mayor Cunningham has invited us to Waukegan to buy us all dinner when we're able to get together. So, and that'll be charged to the water department. So and this is why our relationship has always grown and is interest. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions on the chat, Cheryl or Edith? Nope. Thank you so much, Mayor. Yes, uh, thank, thank you, thank you Marcus, much. and thank you, Maya, for, for, for your help. Moving along, ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker is Mayor Jim Holland of the village of Frankfurt. Now, here's the, check this out, folks. He's retiring after 22 years on the board in Frankfurt. Six years as trustee, four terms as mayor. When Mayor Holland was first elected to the village board in 1999, Frankfurt's population was approximately 7,300. Today, it is nearly 20,000, which of course is all the result of and criticism of Mayor Holland. So all those driving through town who have extra stops, Jim, way to go. Former executive board chairman of the Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus. And here's a fun fact, folks. This guy not only rides along with the snow plowers, but also drives the snow plow trucks when necessary to help remove the fall of snow in Frankfurt. And of course, our colleague Cheryl Scott, who's with the Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus, used to work with Mayor Holland. So we have a great relationship, a great story. Mayor Holland, the floor is all yours to talk about country market, farmer's market in the beautiful city of Frankfurt. Well, thank you, Kevin. It's certainly a pleasure to be here today. And I thank uh, our former employee, Cheryl Scott, for uh, inviting me here today to speak about our farmer's market. Uh, certainly, probably the most environmentally friendly aspect of uh, Frankfurt's farmer's market is uh, that all of the products are locally grown. Uh, there is less energy used to move these uh, products to uh, the consumer. Uh, and we can go to the next slide, please. And certainly another aspect of our particular farmer's market is that it is on a bike trail called the Oak Plank Road Trail in the Southwest suburbs in Will County where we are located. And I and probably at least a hundred or 200 other uh, uh, users of the market uh, ride their bicycles regularly to it instead of driving to the market. So uh, in that sense, it uses a lot less energy. Uh, but on to the next slide. And a key to having a successful farmer's market is to have at least oh, two, but pre preferably uh, four large produce and fruit farmers. Uh, the public needs to get the idea that this is a place to shop for super fresh produce and fruit. It's not a flea market. And we'll go to the next slide. <clears throat> we also have uh, frozen poultry and meat suppliers. Uh, we have many farmers who emphasize uh, organic pro products or otherwise uh, uh, natural products and sustainable products. And the next slide. Uh, again, the emphasis is on fresh, 
And we also have several flower vendors. We have some vendors who serve foods to eat uh, at the site. And we have a few related non-food vendors. For instance, we have uh, a natural fertilizer uh, vendor and of course some flower vendors, but we do not have sunglass, trinket, toy, gold chain or other vendors that are commonly found in uh, flea markets. And the next slide. A successful farmer's market can uh, contribute positively to the environment. Uh, it certainly starts by finding the right farmers and then somebody's got to supply the needs for a proper uh, site. Uh, and that includes electricity, uh, bathrooms and those, and of course a place to park the vehicles and such. Uh, certainly if people do have questions, you're welcome to uh, speak to our special event coordinator, uh, Sue Lynchy at the Village of Frankfurt office. And I'd be happy to take uh, any questions people have. Thank you, Mayor. Any questions or comments for Mayor Holland? Other than what is your favorite product at the uh, market, Mayor? And if you say cannabis, you're gonna be in trouble. No, no cannabis in Frankfurt. Uh, <laughs> we're not impressed with that. So, uh, my favorite products are going to be the fresh products. I can't get them at the uh, grocery store. Now this takes some education of the people. They come in May and they don't understand why they can't get apples. Uh, they come in May or June and there aren't any blueberries yet. These products are in season and the only thing you can get in May or early May is asparagus. Uh, and I'm not so fond of that. But uh, it's great fun to learn about when these different items come into season. And, uh, and they do taste different. The strawberries that we get uh, are just completely different than those California strawberries that we find in the grocery stores. Well, if I could, this is Martha Dooley from the village of Schaumburg. Um, and you're making my mouth water talking about the strawberries and the blueberries because they are much better at the market. Um, I wanted to ask you, we run a farmer's market, and I wanted to ask you if you did implement COVID um, guidelines and things like that for your market in 2020, and have you done any uh, thinking about what you might do for the 2021 season? Yeah, we almost closed our market last year, but uh, the trustees said, absolutely not. We got to figure out a way to do it. So we split it up into several different parking lots. We put fencing around it each week which was cumbersome. Uh, we had employees at the market counting people going in and counting them coming out so that we could limit the number of people. We required masks. Uh, yes, we took COVID precautions. Okay, thank you very much. Sounds like exactly what we did. It was a lot more work, but people were so appreciative, don't you think, of having an event that was outside to go to? Very much so. In our market, I think like yours, is a gathering place. It is a place that go people go to to be seen and to see others. Uh, and so just by its almost definition, it was a problem for COVID. And we had to break that down a bit and slow people down. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, was, it was an interesting process and frankly, not very pleasant. Hey, this yeah. is a Dante again from Hazel Chris. Uh, how difficult or was it difficult to source the farmers uh, for them to bring their, their product out to the market? Yeah, it's where the market really gets started. You've got to find some good farmers who do this sort of thing. Uh, and one of the issues you'll have is the type of farmers who go to farmers markets usually do more than one. And they may do five or six or, or seven or eight uh, every week. So they have certain days that they're full. They, they won't be able to come to your town. So it takes a lot of coordination. We had a person uh, who ran our market when it's really got started, who was from the Farm Bureau. And he knew where these guys were. And that was very, very helpful to us. Mayor Holland, um, we have a, I'm going to consolidate a couple questions in the chat. Um, if you would, could you talk about the boundaries for local? And then there's some questions about um, plastic bags and if you incentivize, bring your own bag. 
Yes, we, uh, on the first question, uh, actually we used to have a definition of local and I think it was 180 miles or something of Frankfurt that they had to come. The definition today is that it has to be able to drive there that day. Um, so these people bring their produce and they have to grow it. They cannot buy it from somebody else and sell it. So that's how we control what's locally grown. On the plastic bag issue, you have to realize that I live in a community that uh, solidly supported Donald Trump for president. We're a very conservative area. Uh, we do have plastic bags at our market, which are controversial um, and I don't like them. Uh, so what we've done is the village has supplied reusable bags and with the market's logo on it. And uh, we sold those for a while and then we just gave them away. Uh, but we had about a thousand of those and we went right through them. Uh, and people do use those and will uh, reuse the bags at the market. I would like to add to that for the COVID situation, we usually highly recommend people bring their own reusable bags and most of them do. But this year we actually prohibited it due to yeah. the potential yeah. spread of disease. I noticed some people towards the end of the year started to bring their own, but we informed the vendors that they did not have to pack produce in, or anything into those bags. They could hand it to the, the customer and they could pack their own bags. So for COVID, it was a little different for us this year. Oh, lots of things were different. We, yeah. we even for a while, we made the vendors uh, wrap all of their product because people go in and they touch things. And, yeah. and we were concerned about that. We gave up on that by halfway through the summer. Yeah, we kind of had to let that go. Yeah. <laughs> we should move on. Okay, right. moving on. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. And happy retirement. Oh, thank you very much for that. I'm looking forward to it. I can only imagine. Folks from uh, Fresh Markets to the Community Garden Program, it's my pleasure to introduce to all of you, whom I think all of you probably know, Carrie Melfeo, the Sustainability Coordinator of the Village of Park Forest. Kiri is Sustainability Coordinator for Park Forest, Vice Chair of the Flossmoor Sustainability Committee, and serves on the Chicago Southland Green Committee. Also joining Kiri is Alex Bazin, a Greenest Region Corps member for Park Forest. Kiri, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that introduction, Mayor uh, Burns. Uh, Can you see my slide yet? Uh, let's see. Not yet. Okay, let's see here. All we can see is an image of- Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Sorry, please um, stop. Stop, sure? Yeah. Okay. Mm, uh, sorry for the technical- No. I did that. It's all good. Uh, okay, and then here. Yeah. Okay. Are we good now? And then share. There we go. Okay. Yep. Better. There we go. Yay. All right. We gotta go. Perfect. Thank you. Um so yes, I am the sustainability uh, coordinator in Park Forest and thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about um, our community gardens program um, here. Uh, a bit of history, everyone knows that community gardens are any piece of land gardened by groups of people. Um, historically, community gardens have played an important role in the US. Um, Victory Gardens in World War II brought people together to garden on public and private land. And at one point during the war, there was over 2 million victory gardens in the US, producing 40% of the nation's vegetables. Um, Park Forest has a long history of the community gardens, going back to the allotment style gardens um, with 352 individual plots started in 1979. Uh, the program was very successful in bringing members of the community together 
to grow their own food and continued through 1994 growing season. Um, the current Park Forest Community Garden Program aims to revive that tradition of growing together and growing food within the community. Uh, 2020 has been our best year with um, 10 community gardens and we're hoping to, of course, uh, grow that number in 2021. So why garden? Um, Gardening is important because more nutrition, no more nutritious, like um, the mayor of Frankfurt said, um, when you pick food closest to the ripeness, it keeps most of it nutritional value. Um, when it's traveling a long way, uh, the nutritional value of the food decreases. And of course you get um, travel emissions and food in your local grocery store travels at least uh, 1500 miles to get to your shelves. Um, it connects people to food, it brings the community together, um, it beautifies neighborhoods, and it's a great way, of course, for exercise and fresh air, and there's always a new um, thing to learn in the garden. So we implemented two different types of community garden programs. Um, the first one, uh, our community garden grant program, um, these are gardens that are on pu public or private land, including schools, workplaces, and houses of wor worship. Um, they're eligible for a re reimbursement of up to $100 per growing season uh, for gar garden creation and development. Uh, eligible projects, oops, sorry, let's go back here. Eligible projects. inclusion of a new community garden, planting native garden, adding features that promote sustainable um, gardening practices, including composting and water harvesting systems, and supporting educational programs. Um, the only caveat is uh, the reimbursement does not cover tools, and we were fortunate enough to um, award up to 20 grants in 2020. Um, this is an annual, annual budget item that we are fortunate to be able to fund. Um, we hope that we can continue this, of course, in the future. Um, one garden this past growing season uh, fit this category. It was um, a STEAM after school program that they took space close to their business, um, let the, girl, the students um, prep the beds, plant, and learn about native plants and veggies right on site. So that was great. Um, the other program is Village Owned Vacant Lot um, Garden Grant Program. And um, this is where the Village Owned Vacant Lots are available to residents to build a garden in exchange for maintaining the lot of the entire growing season. The gardeners can be reimbursed up to $250. Um, which that really offsets the cost of mowing for that whole season. And the reimbursement qualifications are the same as I mentioned before um, as above. So currently in Park Forest, we have about 90 different um, vacant lots that are either village or ban land bank owned. And uh, this is a great way to turn that vacant space into something uh, beneficial for the community um, and we also have, in a part of our application, they are aware that this property could be sold and they have to um, relocate their garden if that happens. So, uh, water options. Of course, that's the, the most important aspect of having a successful garden is being able to access water. So some of the options uh, we suggest is like a rain barrel shed collection system, like the picture is showing that um, setup, um, IBC containers. Uh, and then we also have a neighbor water credit program. Um, these are for properties directly uh, bordering the vacant lots. Uh, they are eligible for $25 or water spigot. Um, this application has to be signed by both parties, of course, and renewed annually. And then also we have a community garden water delivery program. 
If the gardener doesn't have a willing neighbor, uh, they can receive water delivery from Recreation Parks and Community Health Department. Uh, there is a fee of $25 per delivery um, due when the order is placed. Uh, the deliveries will be made on Wednesday. I'm just giving you as the guideline is so you know how the system works, but deliveries are made on Wednesdays. The orders have to be placed by 5 p.m. on Monday prior. Um, and this service will fill up rain barrels or IBC containers on site. Um, the community gardens application for both these programs uh, cover a lot of different areas and I can send a link of um, our applications so you can take a look and how we set them up. But there's questions like, uh, how will your garden benefit the community? Do you serve or engage low income community members? Um, we ask that one person is the designated garden liaison. And of course we have waivers for liability and release. Um, they commit to winter cleanup, a photo policy, an end of year survey, and we encourage composting on site. Um, so here's some examples of our community gardens in our area. So the first is the fire department garden. It was built in 2016 by village staff. Uh, it has grown to nine beds total now, and we currently share it with Aunt Martha's, which is a health and wellness non-for-profit organization located nearby. Um, we have a watering schedule set up and the police, fire, and village hall staff share in the duties and enjoy the harvest. Um, we also have a micro pantry that was just installed this past year. Uh, located at the garden, so any surplus harvest um, goes in there as well. Um, the Neola Street Garden, there's um, currently three groups sharing this lot. Um, one of them is the South Suburban Special Recreation Association. Um, that is a therapeutic recreation program that provides individuals uh, with disabilities or special needs the opportunity to experience the garden space, get their hands dirty, connect with food. Um, another community gardener there has a website blog called Roots to Grow. And all the beautiful photographs that are in this presentation are thanks to her um, to uh, help share with those. Uh, this space is about three city lots and it is almost full of beds. Wow. Um, we have a Leicester Road Community Garden. Um, it's one of the most colorful, as you can see through the photos. Um, buckets are widely utilized in all gardens to add um, extra growing space without soil prep. Um, so that, in, in, that, that involves with an, starting a new bed. Um, the gentleman that runs this community garden has great neighbors. He um, has been doing it for probably six years now. Um, and the way he has the neighbors on board, of course, he shares his harvest with them every season. Uh, the Indian Wood Community Garden is probably the biggest garden of all. I believe it's about seven city lots together. Um, it's very visible in the community and the gardeners always tell us that people are always stopping by asking them questions and inquiring. The Environment Commission uh, is planning to have garden talks at this location this coming spring and summer. Um, and then of course, seeing as people stop and ask questions, we encourage each community gardener to add signage um, to their spaces and to um, put village contact information on it so they could join in the fun. Um, this garden is in the Eastgate neighborhood. Um, this garden is especially beneficial because it's located in economically challenged area. Uh, the woman that started this um, has a deep had a deep desire to show the community how to create a garden and apiary uh, with minimal impact on the natural world. Uh, she started a global restoration fund non for profit and works with the uh, local children to educate, instruct learn beekeeping, plant, and harvest food for their neighborhood. Uh, nearby church saw how, what great work she was doing engaging with the neighborhood and donated children's sized bee suits so the kids could experience the apiary uh, habitat safely. Um, 
She hosts campfires, some more gatherings for the children and their families, and is in the process of building a timed irrigation system with solar panels. Uh, and she also received a sustainability award from the village last year. Um, the St. Irenaeus Church Community Garden, it has been um, in works or has been a working garden for over 10 years and all the produce is donated to the food pantry that is located in the church. Um, currently the food pantry is serving, servicing people twice a week. Um, the photo is only part of the garden space, but wanted to show you their ring barrel and IBC water storage system, which is very impressive. Uh, they have fruit trees, native and pollinator gardens, as well as an extensive compost system. Um, they have utilized wood packing crates to repurpose for raised beds. Um, and the organic produce production is at optimal level. Um, one final note I wanted to uh, let everyone know is we have a free seed library at the Park Forest Public Library. And we have an office full of tools just waiting for the pandemic to end so we can launch our tool lending library, uh, which will be housed at the public library also. So I'm happy to answer any questions and thanks so much for your time and attention. Very, very cool. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Any questions or comments for Kerry? We're a little snug on time, but we do have one. Um, if you can get to that, Carrie, would you allow beehives um, at your sites? And how do you handle any complaints from um, folks who use the vacant lot and uh, when, when it's sold? So bees and then oh, land um, condition. Yeah. Right. Um, we have a bee application, of uh, uh, apiary application, um, and they do have to notify their um, resident, you know, their neighbors um, about the apiaries on site. We do have like yearly inspections. Um, haven't had any um, real complaints at all. Um, the only community garden right now that has uh, apiary is, is that Eastgate one that I had mentioned, but there's a lot of residents that had um, apiaries in their backyard. Um, and then the second part of that question, I'm sorry. Um, uh, about the transition of land when, when a property is sold. Oh, right. Yeah, um, we haven't had too much problem with that just yet. Um, but of course, that would be a lengthy process. So it wouldn't be, um, we'd make sure that the gardeners had plenty uh, ample time to move it. And the raised beds that they put in are pretty easy to remove and relocate. Thank you. And we should move on just so everybody Absolutely. gets a chance. Thank you, Carrie, very much. <clears throat> thank, you. thank you. And again, folks, all this information will be available to you. Uh, Edith and Cheryl will make certain that it's uh, easily accessible. So moving on, folks, uh, the Ashford Detention Basin Naturalization Project is going to be discussed next. And we have the pleasure of uh, Bob Fleck, the Executive Director of Westmont. And as I learned earlier, a native of Westmont, have lived in Westmont your entire life. And according to my Zoom screen, that's about 22 years. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's all yours, Mr. Fleck. Well, thank you, Mayor Burns. Um, appreciate the opportunity to tell you about our project here today. I was invited to uh, share this project by a member of our Environmental Improvement Commission, Glenn Gabriel, who is on this particular Zoom. He happens to live in the subdivision where this project is located. Uh, just a quick little history on the park district and village connection. As you can see from the uh, slide there, uh, I'm with the Westmont Park District. I've been executive director for four years now, but prior to that, uh, for 20 years, I was superintendent of parks and planning for the park district and landscape architect for the village of Westmont as a shared employee. And that relationship, which goes back long before me, has a lot to do with uh, a lot of the native landscape and habitat initiatives that we've implemented here in the community. Uh, prior to that, in the mid 90s and before, if you couldn't pave it and play on it or mow it and play on it, there wasn't much interest here in Westmont. Uh, and then when I came on staff and with the um, 
the cooperation of some others, we began to make that change and realize there was tremendous opportunities for habitat restoration, native landscapes. And I will tell you one of the projects that greatly influenced me shortly after I was out of college and working here was the Peck Farms project in Geneva, which I'm sure Mayor Burns is very familiar with. I had a relationship with some of the designers that were involved in that project. And we implemented some of those ideas into some of the things we've done here in Westmont. Uh, now with that, the park district and the village share a lot of properties together. We jointly own some property, but a lot of our detention basins are in joint ownership and responsibility. So the park district manages it, takes care of it, and the village maintains stormwater responsibilities over those detention basins. Uh, so with that, let's go to the next slide. This is the Ashford subdivision. Built in the late 70s, early 80s, very typical at that time. Uh, this one was unique in that we not only got a detention basin out of it at the park district, we did get an actual neighborhood park, which is right there in the middle of the subdivision. In the northeast corner is the detention basin. Very typical flat bottom, turf grass detention basin. Park district mows it, takes care of it. Um, on this particular one, the village engineer uh, went after a DuPage County stormwater improvement grant to naturalize the basin and pick up more stormwater volume, improve water quality. And we've been doing this at a number of properties throughout the community. We've done it in a number of parks and little by little, we've been making that transition uh, for obvious reasons, reduce maintenance, increase habitat, improve water quality. Uh, so this is a recently completed project, uh, in fact, just months ago, uh, where it was involved WBK Engineering and CAP uh, Construction and Landscape Restoration who did the actual work on this particular project. Uh, next slide, please. This was just a year ago, as you can see, tons of turf grass, a lot of mowing that occurred here on a weekly basis, and it's a flat bottom basin. Flat bottom basins, if you have these in your community, are very difficult to maintain, especially after heavy rainfalls. And we experienced three years of the heaviest rainfalls on record, which made it very difficult to get in and maintain these. We have some that were much more difficult than this one we're gonna be looking to here in the near future. Um, let me show you what happens with a flat bottom basin over time, especially after extensive periods of rain. Next slide. A wetland begins to creep in. Can't maintain it. Um, when it's inundated by water for long periods of time, soil characteristics change. Uh, plants that love wet soils begin to creep in and it inherently becomes a different environment, a different landscape, uh, and we can't get in and mow it. Sometimes the neighbors aren't happy about that and wanna know why we've let it go, why we're not maintaining it as parkland anymore. Well, we all know it's really a utility to make sure that their basements don't get flooded. Um, so why not work with nature instead of fight nature? And that was the intent here. So with that particular stormwater grant, it was an opportunity to naturalize it, but also pick up additional stormwater volume. Uh, next slide, please. This was September. It doesn't look like much right now, but the project was completed. That is a soil erosion control blanket that's over in the entire basin. And this is the section of it that is Mesic Prairie. It was seeded, it's got a cover crop on it that will start coming in the spring. Doesn't look like much right now, but again, recently completed. The berm you see there in the background of this particular picture, that was the material that was excavated out of the bottom to pick up additional stormwater volume. So there's a few berms throughout, and this is where we're at today. Next slide, please. 
And that is the wetland that was created in this. Now the wetland you saw in the existing conditions is still there. This was an expansion, an enhancement of that wetland for additional volume and also for additional habitat. Um, it'll make it easier to maintain this long-term by having a little bit of wetland in there and then on the higher elevations, the upper slopes, moving to a prairie type seeding. So it's um, mesic prairie to upland prairie on the berms. And that is not seeded. There, are, there is some seed in the wetland there, but those are mostly live plugs for um, uh, immediate establishment of that. And with the fact that those soils are already wet, it's easier to get the plugs to become established rather than trying to seed 100% of it. Um, so that is the project. That's where we're at today. It, you can't see it right now. We do have a six foot mow strip of turf grass that is going around the entire perimeter of this. So over time we can come in and burn it. So for 20 years now and only about 15 years successfully, we've been doing controlled burns throughout the community. We've been doing them on detention basins. We've been doing them in our parks and the community is becoming more and more familiar with it. So once they become established, our maintenance has been cut down dramatically, leaving our mo crews to then hopefully do other things and we can do some more beautification and less time mowing our detention basins and some areas within our parks. Uh, so this is just an example of some of the things we've been doing here over time in Westmont. And uh, like I said, we've got some more of these planned in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. I know we're, we're running close to time. Just a quick question, Bob. How many acres is that site that you just shared with us? That is a four, just over four acre detention basin. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cheryl or uh, Edith, anything pertinent? It, we are running a little short on time. So if you have questions, please put them in the chat. And again, we'll be sharing links. And Bob, uh, your reference of Peck Farm Park uh, is uh, deeply appreciated. You may or may not be aware my father served as the Park District Board President for years and actually negotiated the acquisition of the land that is now Peck Farm Park. Uh, impressive. Great legacy for Geneva. Yeah, small world, small world. We're moving on, folks, to sustainable flood mitigation efforts. We have the mayor of uh, North Chicago, Mayor Rockingham, who's with us and has been with us from the beginning. Mayor, welcome. Uh, mayor Rockingham has been the chief elected officer since 2005. We also have joining us the public works director of the city of North Chicago, the distinguished career in public works, expertise in solving flooding issues, Edward Williams. So with that, Mayor, Mr. Williams, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mayor Burns. And uh, you know, this, is a, this will be a kind of a tag team. Uh, I never like to go into something alone and make sure I got a, a good team around me. So uh, again, Ed Wilmus, uh, he was my public director. Uh, and uh, also I have Nimrod Water, one of our planning uh, engineers, and then uh, Kurt Wilford uh, from uh, Lake County Stormwater. So just real a quick background, uh, North Chicago was uh, up in the northern section of uh, the community, Lake County. Uh, we had a, a actually a uh, housing development, stormwater, uh, strawberry condominiums that continue to be flooded and Route 41, which is a major, major uh, thoroughfare that would flood out also. So we had to do something to try to uh, eliminate and to help to uh, uh, remove some of that flooding. So uh, this is a, a actually a, a collaboration with a uh, few entities to make sure uh, that we move towards a, a more sustainable effort in regards to the uh, water. So with that, I'm gonna actually turn it over to real quick to uh, Nimrod Warder, who will give it to Kurt from the uh, Lake County Stormwater Agency, uh, Nimrod. Hello, everybody. Happy 2021. Thank you. Um, as uh, the mayor said, I'm Nimrod Ward. I'm the senior planner with uh, the Department of Economic and Community Development, City of North Chicago. Uh, in a few moments, our partners from the Lake County Stormwater Management Commission will uh, likewise introduce themselves and provide some more details about the subject at hand. 
Uh, before we get into the meat of the presentation, I just want to quickly provide a brief rundown about the city of North Chicago for those who are unfamiliar with our culturally diverse community. Uh, we are located roughly 35 miles north of downtown Chicago in the northeast quadrant of Lake County. Um, it's less than 15 miles from the Wisconsin state line and about 55 miles south of Milwaukee. Uh, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, uh, we are roughly about 30,000 residents at this time, which about half of that is Naval Station Great Lakes. We are proud to be home of Naval Station Great Lakes, which is the only boot camp for the U.S. Navy, um, as well as the home to the Captain James A. Lovell Federal Health Care Center, which services active duty and retired military members alike. Uh, within our city, we have uh, internationally uh, recognized health and pharmaceutical giants such as Abbott Labs, AbbVie. Uh, we also have Rosalind Franklin uh, University and a, and a variety of other industries that you can see on the screen. Um, now, with respect to the project at hand, um, much of the discussion today will stem around uh, a few major flood events that occurred over the past few years, most notably in 2014 and 2017. Uh, so the entire city was actually impacted in both occasions, but one section town was disproportionately hit harder than the others. Uh, that was namely the area around the Skokie Highway Corridor, which is the far west side of town. Uh, the epicenter, as the mayor mentioned, is just south of um, Illinois 137 Buckley Road, which is a 247-unit uh, uh, residential development referred to as Strawberry Condominiums. Uh, this development was actually built in 1972 and is now nestled behind what is a major commercial corridor. Um, obviously, at that time, they had different uh, standards for stormwater issues. And uh, one thing that we noticed that's uh, the, the key contributing factor here is, unfortunately, this was bit, uh, built in a bit of a bowl. Uh, this development sits about five feet lower than the surrounding area. And so due to these topological differences, uh, during the event in 2014, there was roughly 54 condo units that uh, took on significant water damage, uh, some of them having over two feet of water on the ground floor. Um, then uh, there, during the 2017 event, uh, unfortunately, there were, there were some actions taken, but 50, or 48 units were also flooded. Uh, in both cases, Multiple vehicles were also flooded out, um, many of them being completely totaled. Um, but also, uh, after each event, there were actions performed both on and off-site to help mitigate the flooding, yet the need for larger-scale planning was evident uh, to help reduce the likelihood of more water damage, uh, sorry, more water damage debris and personal items making their ways into landfills. Also, uh, unfortunately, a good number of the folks who live at those buildings, uh, their insurance would not cover the expenses because this was not considered a floodplain area. Uh, so, well, that being said, for more information on the events and the subsequent matters, I'll pass things along to our friends at the Stormwater Management Commission. Uh, Kurt, you can take it from here. Okay, thanks, Nimrod. Uh, yeah, so good morning, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity to highlight one of our flood mitigation projects in Lake County. Uh, also on the in the presentation, I want to introduce Ashley Strelchek, and she's a water resources professional with the commission. And we uh, have a large coordination effort with multiple levels of government, which we'll go into detail here. So I wanted to invite Ashley too. Um, but I know that flooding affects everyone's communities. Uh, you've either been personally affected or within your community. Flooding is the number one most common natural disaster in the United States, in Illinois, in Lake County, and possibly even in your communities. Uh, but flooding is natural and flood damage has been recorded 350 years ago when Father Marquette set up his cabin along the Chicago River, he flooded out and damaged his cabin. So flooding's not new. It's been uh, experienced throughout the ages before development, before European settlement, but now we have new approaches to mitigate flooding and maps to identify where these floodplains are. And the one message I wanted to convey to the group is that all of your communities, if you have FEMA mapped floodplains in your community, you should take a look at the 500 level, 500 year level floodplain. If if it's shown in your community. Uh, Lake County, we've done some analysis on our Des Plaines River corridor. And due to the development in upper Des Plaines River in Wisconsin, along I-94, you can drive up to Milwaukee and you'll see all the development that's occurring. 
As development continues, more runoff adds to our watersheds and the increased rainfall is making problems even worse. So through our analysis for the Des Plaines River and Lake County, the 500 year floodplain that is shown on the FEMA map is approximately the new 100 year level. And I'm not saying that's gonna be equal to your communities, but it gives you an idea of what the future may look like in your communities. Now the FEMA maps only tell half the story. There's a lot of urbanized flooding that occurs outside of these floodplain areas like the strawberry condos, but uh, it's a pretty quick look to look at your community and look at those FEMA maps and take, it, take a look at those 500 year levels. Uh, I'm gonna move along quickly, but why is flood mitigation important? Well, as we add more impervious surface, there's more runoff. Now, I used to present this slide and I've enhanced it now. And on the right, you can see the clouds and the raindrops are a little bigger now. We're getting more extreme precipitation. We're getting more frequent events. It's overwhelming the outdated infrastructure that we have. And the third item there is maintenance or lack of, you know, stormwater maintenance typically goes unnoticed until it becomes a problem. There's not enough proactive maintenance. Uh, there's not a lot of funding resources to handle it, but due to the maintenance problems of the existing systems, that leads to additional flooding. This is the Strawberry Condos development, and you can see uh, the wetland complex on the west side, and like Nimrod described, the, the condos themselves were developed in a bowl. So they're actually lower than the wetland themselves. And when the wetland receives a lot of runoff, it overtops and spills into the condominium complex. So through multiple internal phases, we tried to alleviate the flood damages within the subdivision. This was one of our recent phases where we constructed a, a flood relief channel along the west property line that intercepts the overflow and then diverts the water around the condominiums. Another project that we're in discussions with IDOT and the tollway, they own the wetland complex. We wanna reconstruct a diversion berm between the two properties. So the sheet flow of the water will hit this berm and not over top into the subdivision, but it'll actually be diverted around the subdivision. Uh, I'll get into those details in a second, but really one of the main uh, discussion points is drainage and floodplains, they don't respect political boundaries. Water's gonna flow downhill. It's gonna go through multiple jurisdictions, multiple properties, and to really facilitate a solution for a regional flood problem such as this, strawberry condos, there's problems internally, there's problems upstream, and there's problems downstream. So the downstream area is the Route 41. That's the picture that you see there. All of Route 41 is submerged, businesses are impacted, roads are closed, there's vehicular safety issues. And then this water needs to drain further east into the Skokie River, which runs through the Great Lakes Naval Station um, area and there's military housing within the naval station that floods as well. So we identified local drainage, state drainage, and federal drainage issues. And just as uh, the previous presenter talked about, about responsibilities, there's a lot of finger pointing that goes on and whose responsibility is it to maintain all this? Well, instead of the finger pointing, that's where one of our jobs at the commission is to facilitate these interjurisdictional drainage problems. We identify the problem, whose properties are they? And this has been just a, a real successful effort and everyone has done their part to put this flood mitigation plan together. We're, we're still working on it. There's a lot more work to do. Uh, this is a concept plan that shows the Strawberry condos up here in the left, upper left. Here's the wetland complex on the western side that all drains through the condos currently, which we're trying to divert. 
Then the water overflows down Bittersweet Avenue. That becomes a, a big drainage channel on the road itself and then floods out Route 41 and that's a state road. Then the water has to go under an undersized railroad culvert that was built a long time ago before all the development and that acts as a bottleneck. Then through the Navy station, the Naval station and here are the Naval military housing units that flood. So we have a lot of flooding, different jurisdictions. We've got a concept plan to move more water into the Skokie River. And that's going to be a conveyance improvement to alleviate the residential, the roadway flooding. But then on the Navy base, we needed to look at how do we alleviate the flooding on the Navy base? And you can't just push water downhill and, be, and make it impact somebody else. So on the Naval Station, we're looking at some culvert upsizing to move water down the Skokie River. And then there's communities downstream in Highland Park that flood. So we need to make sure this is a balancing act and we're not impacting our neighbors downstream. So recently we've discussed with the Lake Bluff Golf Course to add some storage on their site. Uh, the picture on the left, this is that wetland complex and this is currently owned by IDOT and the tollway. This was a mitigation facility and wetlands can provide a lot of natural flood storage. So we're looking at acquiring this property and enhancing the wetlands, providing additional uh, flood storage on that property in addition to enhancing the wetlands themselves. Uh, so with that, I just wanna say it's been a successful effort working under uh, you know, the lead of North Chicago and then cooperation with the state, with the Navy. We've got uh, Union Pacific Railroad. We've got a lot of other partners that have stepped up. So this is just a, a real good example of how uh, intergovernmental cooperation can work together to alleviate regional flooding in Lake County. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Sure, that's a extraordinarily impressive undertaking. I, I trust you'll be renaming Bittersweet Way to like Collaboration Boulevard or something, or I'll defer yeah. to the city on that. <laughs> we'll we'll consider that. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a that's a it's almost mind-boggling how complicated that is. Wow. And I think that I think that was one of our biggest uh, hurdles to have to get through, is because we had so many entities involved, and uh, that the wetlands it's also considered a high quality wetlands okay. so you can't really just get in there and and try to do changes because of the native species and the plants that are associated with that part of the area so Edith that could be a field trip in the future heading up there That'd yes uh, that's what I was going to suggest as well. So um, great sessions, short short presentations on flooding, but I think we'd love to come out and uh, take a look at some of these sites. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, free lunch in Waukegan. So. <laughs> <laughs> we have Mayor Cunningham pay. Absolutely, we will. <laughs> our next presentation, ladies and gentlemen, um, is by our friend Dante Sawyer, the village manager of the village of Hazelcrest. He's going to talk about something that, um, gosh, probably is on nobody's mind locating lead service lines and plans to remove them. Uh, this has been a topic of, of great interest and discussion for years and years and years. Uh, we're delighted to have Dante with us. Uh, Dante, welcome, and the floor is yours, sir. Uh, thank you, Mayor Burns. Um, welcome. Uh, my name is Dante Sawyer. I'm the village manager here at Hazelcrest. Uh, Mayor Allisberry, who uh, was able to participate earlier, he had asked a question. Um, uh, he had to jump off, so uh, he sent his regrets. And uh, so presenting with me will be our Greenest Region uh, course member, uh, Mr. Jordan Henderson. So uh, you guys have been stuck with the B team for today. So we'll, we'll try our best to keep it. Uh, no, this is the A team. This is good. <laughs> so uh, the village of Hazelcrest um, recently became a, uh, a member of the uh, Metropolitan, excuse me, of the Mayor's Caucus uh, Greenest Region Initiative about two years ago. And um, this will be our second year with Jordan where we have a member dedicated to help the village focus on sustainability projects. Uh, Hazelcrest is a community about 27 miles south of Chicago. 
uh, roughly about 13,800, give or take a few hundred based on the next census outcome. And as uh, Mayor Burns already presented, there's been a lot of energy, uh, a lot of recent energy around the replacement of lead service lines throughout the state of Illinois. Uh, most recently, uh, there was a, a, a bill presented um, in a lane duck session um, uh, from, the, from the lens of uh, economic uh, equity to have these lead service lines removed because uh, they tend to be uh, located in uh, communities of lesser means, communities of color, uh, Hispanic uh, and Black African-American communities. So what the Village of Hazelcrest wanted to do with this project, we'll put ourselves in the best position um, to be shovel ready at the time where uh, there is some assistance made available to local communities to remove lead service lines. So the first thing we have to do is actually identify where the lead service lines are at in order to make a plan to have them removed. So with that said, I'm gonna turn it over to, again, Jordan Henderson, who is our Greenness Region Court member, who is um, helping take the lead on this project for the village. Jordan. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so first I'll uh, provide a little context around Hazelcrest and lead. Um, we get our water from Lake Michigan, like most uh, Chicago area communities, and that water is regularly tested uh, against a number of contaminants, including lead. Um, and that testing is done per Illinois EPA requirements. Um, so why is lead so dangerous? Essentially, there is no safe level of lead exposure. It doesn't matter your age, gender, or health demographics. Lead is dangerous for everyone, um, but children under six represent the most at-risk population. This is because lead can cause a number of physical and cognitive development that uh, can last the rest of their lives. And so this picture on the left is an infographic that we use that shows a number of different ways lead can enter your home. Uh, the primary way lead gets in is through a lead service line coming into your house. Um, however, non-lead lines can still be soldered together with lead, uh, which can again lead to leaching into the water supply. And then the picture on the right is a picture of a lead service line within a home itself. We use it to help residents self-identify the line in their homes. Um, and what makes it stick is scratched with a coin or a flathead screwdriver. And so now I'll turn it over to Dante again to speak a little bit about how Hazelcrest has started this process. So uh, initially, um, we started this process uh, by the, the, greenest, the greenest region member that we have uh, prior to Jordan, uh, individual by the name of Cheryl Watson. Uh, she was able to connect us to a technical assistance grant uh, provided by the Metropolitan Planning Council uh, in assistance with the Center for Neighborhood um, Technology. Uh, as, part of our as part of our participation in this technical grant assistance, uh, we wanted to be prepared for any mandate that will come out from the uh, from Illinois Environmental Protection Agency requiring us, requiring communities to remove lead service lines. And also uh, in the, any other future legislation that may come with uh, providing assistance or guidance on how communities can help address this issue. Go to the next slide, Jordan. Uh, we started our, our commitment by, for, by uh, the board adopting a resolution uh, saying that they're going to take direct action to reduce the uh, amount of lead exposure in our residents' drinking water. Um, as Jordan um, uh, initially stated, there's no self, excuse me, there's no safe uh, amount of exposure for individuals, um, particularly uh, the youth or those with already compromised health issues. And so our village board voted and, and, and passed a resolution which says that we will take action to address this issue. So uh, it outlined the steps uh, that we will take and it puts some goals and some objectives that we as a community are, are, are planning to get done in order to help um, address, this, address this item for our residents. And so at the first step after that uh, resolution comes actually locating where lead service lines are. And with the help of the Center for Neighborhood Technology, uh, Hazelcrest was able to develop a predictive mapping tool that shows the likelihood of a lead service line within a home. Um, and these predictions are drawn from a number of data points, but primarily driven by similarities one house has um, to a nearby concern, confirmed lead service line within another home. Um, and as you can see on the right, 
Uh, there are two neighborhoods that stick out within Hazelcrest as having a higher number of likely or confirmed lead lines. And this is shown by the orange and the red colors. Um, might need to move this. Um, and as expected, these two neighborhoods are um, among the oldest neighborhoods within the village and would likely have been built before lead service lines began to be phased out. And then once we know where the lead service lines are, we're currently finalizing our plan with uh, MPC, but it will include replacement priorities based on income level, as well as a schedule for uh, this re replacement process and um, sources of funding. And we want to make sure that this process is done in an equitable manner. Um, and this mapping tool allows us to do just that. Uh, we can filter the map by homes with children, the age of the home, and in the picture on the right, by median income. And as you'll see that uh, the two neighborhoods that had the highest likelihoods with uh, some of the lowest uh, number of lowest median income within the village. Um, so there's a lot of intersection here that we're looking at. And so finally, what's left for the village to do? Um, and that's to begin the process of removing uh, the lead service lines in accordance with our plan. Um, uh, most importantly, we need to secure funding. Lead service lines represent a significant investment for residents because they technically own the service line all the way up to the property line. So we need to create a way for everyone to be able to afford or finance their replacement. Uh, to determine priority for the initial rounds of replacement. Uh, and this would look at uh, high density of intersecting variables like lead identification, median income, uh, homes with children, and the age of the home itself. Um, and then finally, of course, just more outreach. More cooperation means more success. Um, and in this case, uh, the more positive identifications of lead lines that we get from our residents, the more accurate tool allows us to become more and more efficient uh, within our planning. Great work. Great work. Just a quick question, if I may. The predictive modeling that you reference, Jordan, do you receive phone calls from folks who say, all the way, I may not be in proximity to what is expected to be a home that has lead lines. Please check mine anyways. Yeah, so that tool actually has yet to be published. We're looking at yeah. doing that um, as soon as we get the, the lead service line finished up and we can get everything ready to go. Um, but we're sort of expecting that kind of yeah. concern and participation from the residents. Okay. And we, you... have a, we have a formal presentation um, to the board coming up on January the 26th, after which is when we'll be publishing the, the final report. Okay. Dante, thank you very much. Jordan, thank you. Thank you, guys. Yep. Folks, we're going to move on to our last presentation, but by no means our least, because this is a presentation by a, a good friend of mine, a friend of the environment, certainly a friend of Geneva. His name is Jay Womack. He's the Natural Resources Committee Chair and a Senior Landscape Architect at Huff and Huff. On my notes here, folks, I want you to see this. These are my notes that are sometimes, <laughs> and on the bottom of my notes, it says, quote, these guys are crazy. They lost their ash trees in Geneva and turned to the bottle for help. Ladies and gentlemen, wine, cheese, and trees event by the Natural Resources Committee in Geneva. A big hello to Jay Womack, the Lorax of our community. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mary Burns. Um, thanks for inviting me to speak. Um, as he said, I first and foremost, I'm a landscape architect. I'm also an ecologist. I work for a company in Oak Brook called Huff and Huff. Uh, but the Natural Resources Committee is an all-volunteer group. We're about 10 strong. We've been in existence for almost 15 years, of which I've been the chairperson for at least 13, because nobody else wants to do it. Um, a number of years ago, we do a lot of different projects. We do an Earth Day event, we do a Fox River cleanup, we do, uh, I help work on uh, the forest preserve for King County Forest Preserves to clean out buckthorn and honeysuckle. In a number of years ago, we've lost a lot of our um, elm tree or our ash trees to emerald ash borer. 
and the Natural Resources Committee came to the city and said, we want to help. Uh, we want to help plant trees. And we started adding up what it would take us to replant 2,800 trees. And we realized we needed some serious money to help us do that. And so we came up with this idea called Wine, Cheese, and Trees. And we made a film last year. This will be our 10th year in 2021. It'll be virtual this year. Last year, we had 250 people. We brought in over $35,000. Almost every single thing is donated. Um, and we teamed up this year with the Geneva Park District Foundation. So we split the proceeds to plant trees. Last year, we planted almost 250 trees amongst our, our two groups um, to, to bring back our, our urban forest. And so with that, I'm gonna, we, we have a film, and that's what I'm gonna end with that kind of shows what Wine, Trees and Trees looks like. And again, 100% volunteer driven. So thank you. Trees are incredibly important. They serve a lot of functions. As a tree grows, it provides shade, it provides structure, it provides scale for our city streets. It absorbs airborne pollution, it provides oxygen, it takes in carbon. Uh, but really what it's doing is it's, it's a gift for the future for our children. There's just so much that a tree is good for, and we hate to lose that. It's really exciting when you start and you plant a tree in your yard and watching it grow over the years. You know, it's like watching your family grow. Uh, you know, you just see these very positive things occur. The organization, like the Natural Resources Committee and the Geneva Park District Foundation, are important to the city and to the, to the residents because we volunteer our time to promote something that is good about the city. In this case, it's the environment. And a lot of people take our environment for granted. We've got the Fox River right next door to us. We've got a lot of great trees. Those places need our help. And they need people who can protect them, can look out for them. And so volunteers are a very important part of the city of Geneva and protecting our environmental assets. The focus recently has really been the replanting of trees, which were hit with different diseases that unfortunately do come along, as well as maintaining a very healthy environment. So the emerald ash borer is a very nasty bug that's attacked our ash trees, our green ash in particular which was an incredibly popular street tree for a while because the green ash is native to the floodplains of our rivers. So what we're trying to do is we work with the city, we work with our public works department, we work with the city staff, and we're looking to diversify our canopy with particularly native trees. So this will be our ninth year doing wine, cheese, and trees. Fundraiser is important because the city of Geneva doesn't have the funds readily available every single year to plant trees. This year, because we teamed with the Geneva Park District Foundation, we were able to plant 200 trees. So by joining forces, we're able to plant almost three times as many trees as we normally would plant. Wine, Cheese, and Trees is a great celebration of everything that we have environmentally and uh, the coming together to put more trees into our parkways in order to sort of uh, build the legacy of all different age stages of uh, forest. Um, and uh, canopy. Wine, Cheese, and Trees is really an event to bring a bunch of people together to have fun, celebrate, to inform them a little bit about the trees and about the, you know, the greenways in Geneva and how we can, uh, you know, take care of the trees that we have and to um, replace the ones that are no longer here. It's a great event. It's a wonderful way to raise money for Geneva and to uh, get more trees. Unfortunately, we lost some over the last few years, and this is a great way to replace those, and hopefully even a lot more. We had the idea for the spent about 10 years ago, and we felt like Geneva City of Trees needed more trees. And then about the same time, the Animal and Ash Board hit, and we were devastated. We lost 2,800 trees, City of Geneva, and we said we have to do something. It's the community. It's our community. So this is kind of our legacy for Geneva. Events like this are good for the community. They build community. It's good for people to get to just know each other in the area. But of course, honestly, we're here tonight to raise money to plant trees. There's so much research out there that shows that having trees in the environment that we live in makes us healthier, happier, and better people. So we have plenty of wine and, and, and beer for people to partake in as, as they go out there. But there's auction items. There's some items that are in a silent auction. Some are in a raffle. And then there's actually a live auction where we, you know, raffle off, off various things. Dinners in Geneva and golf, golf outings and sporting events and 
you know, wine cellars and just all kinds of different things. So there's something for everybody. The community of Geneva has a broad-based citizen support. This particular event is very important to the community because we lost well over 2,500 ash trees. So this is helping to reforce the parkways across Geneva. You just see people standing everywhere, laughing, having a good time. It's just a very warm, glow, sort of an atmosphere that is amazing in the middle of February. <laughs> it's just a great event. We'd love to see everybody turn out. It's kind of, we think it's the event of the year for Geneva, and it's just a wonderful way to uh, give back to our community. I think it's good to bring everyone together for a good cause. Um, raising money for things like nature is, I think, is really important. It's just always an enjoyable event. You get to see people that you know, and you're raising money for a good cause. Geneva really benefits because these trees are all getting replaced through the Wine, Cheese, and Trees event and through this hardworking committee, the Natural Resource Committee, that has been doing such a fabulous job for so long. Besides the beauty of the trees, they clean the air, they're important to the birds, they're important to the environment. And if we lose the trees, we're going to lose an awful lot. Our parks will be there, they won't be as beautiful, and they're just, they're just wonderful to have around. I think of my grandchildren as we plant these trees because we want them we want them to see these trees grow and, and as they grow a tree is like a person it has personality every single tree is different every single tree has uh, a place and when it takes its roots and it sets its roots it's in that place for a long time and we'd love to see those trees grow we'd love to see them nurtured so when we plant a tree we're planting it for our future and that's what i love about geneva is geneva embraces us helping them to plant those trees it's rewarding to do things and give back. You give back to your community, you meet people, um, you stay active. We love it when people get involved. We love it when people come out and, and uh, come to our meetings. We meet every, every or the first Wednesday of every month at City Hall, and we're always looking for residents who are interested in being involved, who especially have the uh, interest of the environment in their heart to come out and, and participate. So that's wine, cheese, and trees. <clears throat> the, uh, the, the word I think of is inspirational. Uh, we try to inspire people. It makes me cry. I do think about my grandkids all the time. And we're very lucky, but we need, we need our trees need our help. Our cities need our help. And um, it's what we're here for. And volunteers can make a difference. We make a huge difference. And I'm, you know, I'm very fortunate to know so many people on this call. I've worked with some of you in your municipalities and your cities. And that's why I give of myself because we all give of ourselves. And you know, like you've seen it in the presentations today. That it, takes a, it takes a village to raise a community. And I'm very, very proud of what we've done. The Natural Resources Committee has been around for 15 years and we're all volunteers. And I remember when we we went out on a limb and we gave away compact fluorescent light bulbs and we thought we were on the cutting edge and we were crazy. And then when we started Wine, Cheese and Trees, we thought who would show up to an event and pay money to be here? And, and they do, we over, over 250, almost 300 people last year. And we brought in $35,000 and we used that to replant our parkways in our city, city streets. So. It's a great opportunity and we're really fortunate and our mayor, Mayor Burns has been very supportive and, and shows up at every event as well. So we appreciate his help. So thank you very much. I just, just on the off chance, people are curious in the chat room, Mayor Cunningham of Waukegan said that he's gonna buy 100 tickets to this year's event. <laughs> 100 raffle tickets. 100, right, yeah. Jay, he's bought great, her man. ticket. Thank Nicely you. done. Well done. To everybody, thank you so much for the materials you presented, for the passion in which you presented it, for your commitment to doing what is right, despite sometimes not being easy. And it's a really a pleasure to spend the morning with you. Um, Edith or Cheryl, anything else we need to share before wrapping up? 
I just want to thank everybody. It was such an amazing diversity of topics and issues across the region. I think we've got ideas for more um, uh, in detailed sessions that we'd like to plan. And speaking of that, um, we are doing a survey. This is a, just a bit of a check in on our environment committee. We haven't done a sustainability roundtable in almost two years or maybe more than two years. Um, and we haven't really checked in on topics. So if you would fill out the survey, Cheryl, just put that um, in the chat and tell us what you'd like to hear more of this or a topic we haven't addressed before. Um, we do try to be timely and, and supportive. Um, also, if you like this form format, please let us know. Uh, we do have a meeting. We had a meeting scheduled for February. Topic, um, we still have the meeting. That is February 16th. Um, the topic will be um, to, uh, determined. We are, is there, is there any interest in um, having Earth Day planning as a topic? Um, if you wanted to respond to that in the chat, uh, planning events, so we can learn something about the online. Um, and uh, then we will do building codes in March. That's been a topic um, of great interest for stretch codes and such. So no, we have not done this topic for more than two years. This is, um, this is uh, something that we fall back to either when we run out of ideas or when it's just time for something fresh. So again, if you, we've had some good comments, if you'd like that, please let us know. Um, and again, thank you to everyone for sharing um, Cheryl, Cynthia, did I miss anything? No, I think that's all. Yeah. There's still a hearty dialogue going on in the chat. Um, we haven't had time um, to get to, to everything. There's just been a lot of interest um, in the topics and uh, apologies for running over a little bit, um, but really great to have the feedback and uh, uh, the questions to all the speakers. We will be following up with you just to make sure that we can um, uh, post good resources online. And I did send the link to the chat in the environment committee, but we'll email all of you um, with that uh, link to the page so you can find past meetings. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we know it's uh, late in the morning and I'm certain you're eager for lunch or whatever noon hour brings you. So thank you all very, very much for your time and for your attention and for your continued commitment to achieve what our mutual goals are, a more sustainable region. So thank you very, very much. Enjoy the rest of your day and happy inauguration day tomorrow to all of you who will be tuned. Thank you. Very Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. All right. Be well.